What's up YouTube? Ryan here with 1517 Films where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints and on this episode we're talking about guns. Now I waited a few days to even make this video because I wanted just to let some time and distance pass. I'd honestly been thinking about making it since the most recent church shooting in Texas and now with the Second Amendment protest rally in Virginia, I think it's a good time since it's been a few days to step back and look at whether or not Christians have the right to keep and bear arms according to the dictates of their faith and not necessarily the government. Now, American citizens, we certainly have the right keep and bear arms, and that right shall not be infringed upon. And that is what the entire protest was about. This calm, respectful, unprovoked, unviolent protest where not a shot was fired, there were no arrests made, and they even cleaned up after themselves. This is exactly what the Second Amendment was for. The government in Virginia is attempting to infringe upon the rights of the people to keep and bear arms, and so in accordance with the Second Amendment, they formed a well-regulated militia on account of they have the right to keep and bear arms. It was a show of force. They were there. They were heavily, heavily armed, protecting their constitutional right to keep and bear arms. But what about us? What about Christians? While there's a lot of factors that we need to consider, we need to consider that we're citizens of heaven and we're citizens of the earth. We need to consider that we're citizens of the United States of America and that our founding documents state that we have certain unalienable rights given to us by our creator. So that's worth examining as well. And I think we need to understand all of this in the context of the, the summary of the commandments themselves. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. You should love your neighbor as yourself. So the question is, really to that second part, is a Christian having a gun, loving and serving his neighbor? Now there's a couple places that, that Christians and gun enthusiasts will go to. One in Luke, where Jesus tells his disciples to go out and buy a sword. There's another place where Christians will go in Matthew, where Jesus says to turn the other cheek. Now it's not about one verse over another. It's both are true at the same time. That Jesus did tell his disciples to go out and buy a sword. And we see in the cruelty in the heart of man what they did with that sword in the garden when they cut off that, that, that Roman's ear. And we see the love and mercy of Christ to restore his creation from violence by healing him even as he was going to his unjust trial. So, yes, both are true. Christians, we turn the other cheek. And Christians... We can go out and buy a sword. Sorry, cat's playing by the tripod. Um, sorry, completely distracted. Now, this all boils down to loving and serving your neighbor. And I think we have a good visual representation right here where we have the Ten Commandments. Now, if we look at the Fifth Commandment, you shall not kill. What does this mean? According to Luther's small catechism, we should fear and love God, that we may not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and defend him in every bodily need. So it's twofold. The commandment, you shall not kill, or better translated, you shall not murder, is twofold. You are not allowed to deprive your neighbor of their life. You are not allowed to do physical harm to their body. So in answer to the question, do Christians have rights? Yes, we have the right to life. We have the right to liberty, and we have the right to the pursuit of happiness. And all of those, I think, can be found in the Ten Commandments. You know, we have the right to life, you shall not murder. We have the right to liberty. I think that's part of the Fourth Commandment, in that it, 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 it promotes uh, obeying a civil authority that has been put over there to rule so that there can be peace and justice. And the pursuit of happiness. Well, uh, the Ninth and Tenth Commandment, you know, the right to our property. Or the Eighth Commandment, the right to our name and our reputation. So I think, yes, it's fair to say that Christians at the base level do have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, were the Founding Fathers Christians or were they deists? They were deists. I don't know that they were necessarily confessional Christians. But they understood, having come right off of the Revolutionary War, that the authority that God has put into place, governments can and do in this fallen and broken world, go tyrannical. 
they just fought King George, a tyrannical king. Now, a la Romans 13, where we are called to obey the civil authorities, or even uh, in the fourth commandment, we are to honor our father and mother, which then extends into obeying civil authorities. Well, now they broke that commandment, didn't they? And I think that's where turn the other cheek is going to come in. It was treason. It was against the law and against God's law to disobey King George, be he a good or a bad ruler. Now, they made that decision, and they won. They gambled, and they won. But had they lost, well, then it is their responsibility to turn the other cheek and to submit themselves to the consequences for their actions. I think that's a better understanding of what it means to turn the other cheek. But it can also mean a personal choice towards pacifism. But Jesus also said to go and buy a sword. Now, these founding fathers put as the second, the second, number two, in case the first one doesn't work out, the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia being necessary, and I'm losing the words there, so I'll put them up on the screen, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now this is a right that is given to American citizens. That means that American citizens have the right protected by the government, not granted by the government, the right protected by the government to keep and bear arms. That means that we can, as Jesus instructed his disciples, buy a sword. We can buy a gun. We can own guns for self-defense, for the defense of the innocent, and, as we saw in Virginia, to protect ourselves from a tyrannical government. The government trying to infringe upon the rights of the people to keep and bear arms, and the people armed themselves in a show of force, a peaceful show of force, because we also have the right to protest, and said, hey, you're infringing upon one of our civil liberties, and we're not standing for it. And they did it without a shot fired. They did it without any violence or arrests. I dare anyone on the left of the gun control side to function the same way at one of their protests, because they never do. But we live in a broken, fallen, and sinful world. When God created the world, he created it good. When God created man, he declared man very good. Perfect, free will. Now, we used that free will, having been deceived by the devil, but still used that free will to disobey God, to choose for ourselves to be God, by choosing for ourselves that we should know the difference between good and evil, and judge for ourselves the difference between good and evil, as opposed to letting God be God, and let God decide what is good and what is evil. Since then, sin has entered into man. And Adam all die, the Bible says. And the wages of sin is death. You know, sin entered into the world, and the wages of sin is death. Now, we see violence in this world all the time. We see school shootings. We see church shootings. We see child abuse. We see spousal abuse. We see drunk driving. We see it in creation, where we see earthquakes and tornadoes and fires and all kinds of calamity. Creation itself, not just the consciences of man, is falling apart. The goodness and loving mercy of God is that he holds creation together in its brokenness for the sole purpose of sending his son into the flesh to bear our sin and be our savior. And because Jesus has died the death that we deserve, suffered the wrath of God in our place, and risen victorious from the dead, we are now free in the gospel, restored. Now, we have a will. We have a free will. But that free will is not the free will that Adam and Eve had. Our free will is bound to our concupiscence. It's bound to our sinful nature. That given the choice between good and evil, we will choose evil. Given the choice between someone else and ourselves, we will choose ourselves. Because that is the world that we live in, God has ordained an established government. God has commanded certain ways that we should live to maintain good order and decency in a broken and undecent world. Now, guns. Do Christians have the right to keep and bear arms? As citizens of the United States, yes. As citizens of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus did say, go and buy a sword. Was that a command or was that a freedom? It was a freedom. We see what they did with that sword <laughs> in the Garden of Gethsemane. Did Jesus condone that? No. Jesus healed. Jesus is interested in restoring and forgiving sins. 
But in this world, Christians, we're called to obey these Ten Commandments, and we are called to sum them up in two commandments, the first and the second table, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the second table, to love your neighbor as yourself. So I think the question of whether or not Christians have the right to keep and bear arms is answered by asking ourselves this question. Is me as a Christian having a gun going to love and serve and defend the life of my neighbor? And in circumstances where the answer is yes, then even the use of force, even deadly force, is permissible to the Christian. So as an example, when I put my kids to bed at night, I make sure the doors are locked. That's an act of self-defense. I'm locking out a world that might try to enter in and do harm. I'm locking that world out, not because I hate that world, but because I love my world in here. I love my children and my family. I'm also, if you really think about it, loving and serving my neighbor outside of my own home by locking that door because I'm protecting them from what's going to happen to them if they break it down. Yes, if you break into my house, if you break into this house with intent to do harm to my family, I will shoot you. And you have to remember, I am a trained soldier. I served two tours in Iraq. I will neutralize the threat. And that is my right as an American and even as a Christian to do that. I can shoot to kill. Why? Because the second half of the commandment to not murder is to protect the body and the life of my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Well, my neighbor is my children. My neighbor is my spouse. And, as we learn from the parable of the Good Samaritan, my neighbor is my enemy. So, that person that breaks into my house with the intent to do harm to my family is still my neighbor. Now, if I pull out my Glock and point it at him, there's, he's not going to hear me rack it. I always have one in the chamber. But if I point it at him, that threat of force, that threat, that intent to neutralize him as a threat, is love and service to him as my neighbor, because I am preventing him from breaking that commandment. I am preventing him from depriving me of my God-given rights and my family of my God-given rights. I'm stopping evil. Evil exists, and I don't think that's something that the, the, the people on the left really want to admit. But it's true. In the case of that church shooting in Texas, evil exists. And evil was stopped. I think there's another example where the use of deadly force by a Christian was acceptable. Now, that man ended that whole conflict in six seconds. And he ended it with a headshot. And now his experiences and his vocations in life and his training, he was able in a moment to determine what shot to take to spare the lives of everyone around him. And that shot was a headshot. Could he have taken a shot that would not have instantly deprived the active shooter of his life? He was trained to do so and certainly would have in love and service even to that man that broke into the church in a disguise with the intent to shoot it up. It's contextual. And that's the thing that we need to remember. Context is going to dictate. There are circumstances where the use of deadly force is not necessarily necessary. And there are circumstances where it could be determined the Christian murdered someone. But guns, guns are not evil. You see, God instituted governments for our good order and to promote peace. And he says in Romans 13 that that government has the right to make use of weaponry available to them in their time for that purpose. Now, our government in the United States, under which we are obedient, as commanded by God, has afforded to us the right for the purpose of a well-regulated militia, that we, the people, have the right to keep and bear arms, and that right shall not be infringed upon by the government. It's my personal opinion that the fact that I had to pay my government and submit my DD-214 and that I can't walk out the door of my house without a card in my wallet that says I'm allowed to carry my Glock, I think that's an infringement, but that's my opinion. But what they were really driving at in Virginia was more infringements to the point of 
uh, guilty until proven innocent with red flag laws. And the citizens of that community stood up. They formed a well-regulated militia within their right to keep and bear arms, showed those arms to let the government think twice. And they're well within their rights to do it. Now, Christians, you're in your rights to own a gun, and you're in your rights to not own one. You're not in your right to judge anyone who does. None of you have the right to judge me for carrying a Glock when I walk out the doors of my house, and I do. And it's interesting, the number of, of, of people that know that I do, and some of my close friends who, when they're going out, because they don't at the moment have a concealed carry license, will ask me just to go with them. So in that context, me carrying a gun and knowing how to use it, I'm loving and serving my neighbor. I'm obeying the commandment to not murder by protecting and defending their body, by defending their right to life, to liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you want to carry a gun, carry a gun. If you don't want to carry a gun, don't carry a gun. But just remember, as a Christian, when we watch these things happen, what we see when we see a mass shooting is evil in the heart of man. That is our theological stance. That is our biblical stance. It was never the gun that was evil. It was never the truck that was evil. It was never the knife that was evil. It was the person. Evil exists in this world. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble. But Jesus also says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. And we as Christians know, believe, teach, and confess that he is seated at the right hand of the Father with all authority in heaven and on earth given to him. And he, with that authority, tells us to go make disciples of all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything that he has command, commanded and that he is with us always, even to the end of the age. When we are in these circumstances, when I was in Iraq and mortars were falling, Christ was with me. But at the same time, Christ also instituted the government that afforded me the M4 that was in my hand to defend myself. And God has placed me in his mercy in a country that allows me to stay strapped. It's my thoughts on the gun control issue and whether or not Christians can carry guns. And I think I stand with the people of Virginia and I support the Second Amendment of the United States or the second, yeah, the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. As a Christian, I think I can do that. My conscience is free. I live in the freedom of the gospel to choose for myself and my family to keep and bear arms. If that's your decision, that's your decision. If not, well, you're in the freedom of the gospel as well. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.